Eddie Mannix and Howard Strickling are virtually unknown outside of Hollywood and little remembered even there. But as general manager and head of publicity for Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, they lorded over all the stars in Hollywood's golden age from the 1920s through the 1940s. When MGM stars found themselves in trouble, it was Eddie and Howard who took care of them, solved their problems, hid their crimes, and kept their secrets. They were the fixers. How Howard Strickling and Eddie Mannix fixed the most horrible scandals in Hollywood. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, Join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Eddie Mannix and Howard Strickling, the Fixers of Hollywood. The Fixers who buried old Hollywood's biggest scandals. When stars needed something to be swept under the rug, they summoned Howard Strickling. Howard Strickling's phone was always ringing. First it might be Jean Harlow panicking that William Powell had gotten her pregnant. Then it might be a security guard informing him that he'd removed a belligerent Spencer Tracy from yet another bar. Once it was Marlena Dietrich, distraught after discovering John Gilbert's lifeless body. As the head of publicity for MGM, Strickling handled all these potentially scandalous affairs for the studio's stars. From the 1930s through the 1960s, he worked with MGM general manager Eddie Mannix to maintain the carefully curated images MGM had built for each of its movie stars. That meant keeping damaging stories out of the press, or, if it was too late, making those stories disappear. Mannix and Strickling were an unlikely team. Mannix, a thug who hung out with mobsters, first caught the eye of film executive brothers Nick and Joseph Schenk while working construction at their amusement park in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Strickling was a dapper former journalist who transitioned over to MGM publicity in 1919. But together they quashed almost every type of tabloid item imaginable. At a time when image meant everything and the stars were worth millions to the studios that owned them, Mannix and Strickling were the most important men at MGM. Through a complex web of contacts in every arena, from reporters and doctors to corrupt police and district attorneys, they covered up some of the most notorious crimes and scandals in Hollywood history, keeping stars out of jail and, more importantly, their names out of the papers. MGM had what was called the Special Services Department, which took care of all manner of matters for stars and studio personnel. It has been written it was this department that was involved in a potential cover-ups. This department of the studio could not have done this on its own. It needed complicity with police forces. It had sweeping powers. They handled problems as diverse as the murder of Paul Byrne, husband of MGM's biggest star, Jean Harlow. The studio directed drug addictions of Judy Garland, the murder of Ted Healy, creator of the Three Stooges, at the hands of Wallace Beery, and arranging for an unmarried Loretta Young to adopt her own child, a child fathered by a married Clark Gable. This video describes how a mob-related New Jersey labourer and the quiet son of a grocer became the most powerful men at the biggest studio in the world. The elder half of the Mannix Strickling duo was indeed the tougher of the two. Mannix has been described as a New Jersey bricklayer whose closest friends were mobsters. Howard Strickling, five years younger, was an ingratiating smoothie whose chief mission in life seemed to be kissing the dairy air of MGM boss Louis B. Mayer. Mannix was the most powerful of the two, mostly because he unstintingly undertook the dirtiest assignments Mayer doled out to him. Both men were most forceful when they worked together. Although very different as individuals, they rarely socialised off the lot. They were quite a team. For more than four decades, they were almost inseparable during working hours and, most especially, when problems arose involving MGM's movie star charges. Strickling, who once described himself as just an ambitious punk from a farming town named Gardena, 
when he joined the Metro Company in 1919, headed the MGM Publicity Department from 1934 until he retired in 1969. We told stars what they could and couldn't say, and they did what we said because they knew we knew best. When things went wrong, we had a way of covering up for them too. Closely associated with Louis B. Mayer, Irving G. Thalberg and Howard Dietz in building MGM, Strickling began as an assistant to Pete Smith, publicity and advertising director, and then succeeded him. Mr. Smith recalled at a 1974 reunion that Strickling was one of the few MGM employees to survive changes in administrations and shake-ups. Strickling was the first publicity agent to become a studio vice president. He believed the press agent should be invisible to the public, concerned only with promoting actors, handled Gable Lombard wedding. When Gable and Carol Lombard decided to get married, Gable asked me to come over and bring Otto Winkler, who was then my assistant, Strickling said. He told us his plans. Otto went with them, and I went back to the studio to tell the newspapers. When Carol died in the plane crash in 1942, Otto was with her, and I was with Gable. It was a sad time. Miss Lombard was the only star who ever teased Strick, as he was known, about his stuttering, he recalled. She'd just look at me, start stuttering, and I'd start laughing, he said. Eddie Mannix, MGM's fixer, joined the studio near its inception and was on the payroll until his death in 1963. Mannix, who was written off as a gangster by some and embraced as a straight shooter by others, had a confirmed or suspected hand in covering up everyday misdemeanours like car wrecks and pregnancies, and also some of the most horrible scandals in the history of Hollywood. At the same time, it was Mannix's job as MGM's comptroller and general manager to keep the studio financially afloat, and thus he's maybe more responsible for the longevity of MGM than any other executive. Mannix's second wife, a former Ziegfeld Follies actress-dancer, embarked, supposedly with his blessing, he had plenty of affairs on his own, on an illicit romance with George Reeves, the original TV Superman of the early 50s. Mannix was for some time, and perhaps still, suspected of having Reeves murdered. Strickling was far less colourful in both his professional and personal life. A true blue company man, he brilliantly built up MGM's publicity operation to be Hollywood's best. The techniques he pioneered are still in use today. Titles aside at MGM, Mannix quickly settled into the role of an all-round fixer. He worked in tandem with MGM's head of publicity, Howard Strickling, a dapper former journalist, who controlled how the press reported on MGM's stars and films. Strickling made sure that scandals didn't make the papers, which often meant giving reporters alternate stories to print, and probably also giving them stories about other stars as misdirection. Meanwhile, Mannix made sure the scandals went away. So while Strickling distracted the media, it was Mannix who arranged to get unruly stars out of the drunk tank who made sure to pay off the victims of their car accidents and fistfights, who arranged abortions. When he couldn't scare a star straight himself, Mannix would call in an old friend from New Jersey, i.e. a gangster, to deliver the message for him. He'd read every telegram sent or received through the studio, including personal messages sent by the stars. This was one way the executives could stay on top of any trouble brewing, so they could plan how to respond to a scandal before it happened, or even prevent it from happening. Though Mannix developed close friendships with some stars, for instance he was almost like family to Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy, he could also be extremely unforgiving of the stars under his watch. He had a sign on his desk reading, The only star at MGM is Leo the Lion. Gable and Tracy were regulars at Lee Francis's high-end House of Ill Repute, an apartment building on Sunset Boulevard, across the street from the Sunset Tower Hotel. Francis's girls were paid $1,000 a week, more than most contract starlets. Francis's house was an important part of the way Hollywood men let off steam, and completely integral to the way the studio entertained important out-of-town clients. Who knows how much agency the employees of the House of Francis actually had over their work or their lives, 
but at least there was some kind of transparency about the services they were expected to perform as part of their job. For many young women in Hollywood, the rules and expectations weren't so clear, and the compensation was minimal or non-existent. Of all the scandals that Mannix had a hand in fixing, from Greta Garbo's homosexual relationships, to the probably gangster-related murder of actress Thelma Todd, to the cover-up of a Gable car accident, for which at least one book argues John Huston was made to take the fall. Perhaps the biggest was the story of Patricia Douglas. It started in May 1937, after a year that had encompassed tragedy, including the death of Irving Thalberg, and also triumphs like the major hits Mutiny on the Bounty and The Great Ziegfeld. The MGM boys planned an annual sales convention to end all annual sales conventions. In advance of the five-day conference in Culver City, California, the men who sold MGM's movies on the East Coast boarded a private MGM rail car for the cross-country ride, and they spent the three-day trip pre-gaming. Louis B. Mayer himself and a crowd of hired young ladies greeted the drunken salesman at the train station in Pasadena. These lovely girls, and you have the finest of them, greet you, Mayer said, and that's to show you how we feel about you and the kind of a good time that's ahead of you, anything you want. The festivities for the salesman included dinner at the Ambassador Hotel, a luncheon with stars like Jean Harlow, who would be dead in a month, Gable and Joan Crawford, and finally a party at Hal Roach's Ranch, which MGM was calling the Wild West Show. Held on Wednesday, May 5th, 1937, the party, according to the convention's schedule, promised a stag affair out in the wild and woolly west where men are men. As a teenager, Patricia Douglas had danced in the chorus line behind Ginger Rogers in the Busby Barclay musical Gold Diggers of 1933. By 1937, Douglas was 20, living with her mother and not working regularly in films. When she answered the casting call requesting that she show up at MGM at 4pm on May the 5th, Douglas assumed she was going in for background work in a movie. She later said that if she had known that she was being cast for a private party, she never would have gone. Stars such as Clark Gable and Greta Garbo were worth untold millions to MGM, and the loss of such an asset could easily doom the studio. If fans knew that Gable fathered an illegitimate child or ran over and killed a pedestrian with his car, if Wallace Beery was known as a murderer, if Garbo was known to be an active bisexual, the results would have been disastrous. So MGM had to keep the secrets, make the arrangements, fix things. Eddie Mannix and Howard Strickling were involved in some of the most spectacular cover-ups in the history of MGM, Hollywood and the movies. According to Fleming, the Mannix-Strickling team was behind cover-ups relating to the following. Gable's fathering an out-of-wedlock child by Loretta Young, Van Johnson's arranged Mexico marriage to actor Kenan Wynn's ex-wife when rumours about Johnson's homosexuality became too strong for Mayer to bear. The toll illegal drug use took on Judy Garland. When Mannix learned a female drug dealer associated with gangster Lucky Luciano was indeed selling drugs to Garland in the 1940s, according to Fleming, Mannix had another gangster threaten the drug dealer with being tossed from the highest point of a huge New Jersey amusement park Ferris wheel both happened to be riding at the time. The dealer immediately disappeared from the MGM lot. The details surrounding the Mexican Spitfire Lupe Veldez, one of the few times that the Mannix Strickling team didn't pull off a complete cover-up, they had more success with burying the details of her private life. Mannix and Strickling arranged to have Veldez's final boyfriend, actor playboy Harold Ramond, who impregnated her, banned from every Hollywood studios. These stories are juicy, even hair-raising, but shushed up. Tales involving Beery, Tallulah Bankhead, Gary Cooper, Charles Lawton, Cary Grant, Jean Harlow, Robert Taylor, Barbara Stanwyck, Nelson Eddy and Jeanette MacDonald. Mickey Rooney, and on and on. No true successor rose to take their place, since traditional fixers made little sense outside a traditional studio system. 
where actors are owned and beholden to morality clauses. So much of Strickling, Mannix, their story is bound up in contradictory reports and rumour, but if their confirmed deeds are any indication, it was the fixers, not the filmmakers, who concocted the most twisted tales in old Hollywood. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Strickling and Mannix? They probably knew everybody's hidden secrets in Hollywood.